Act 1, Scene 6. If there was one word to describe this scene, it would be foreshadowing. As we journey relentlessly on towards Duncan's murder, something Shakespeare does incredibly well is build tension through foreshadowing. We, the audience, are left here groaning in our seats as we watch the innocent old Duncan, so trusting, so sure of the loyalty of his thanes, walk directly into the spider's web. This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. Pleasant indeed. This is a fantastic example of a technique of dramatic irony. A special kind of irony, whereby the audience knows something that a particular character does not. Obviously, there is nothing pleasant about this air. The air into which only moments ago Macbeth and his wife were breathing out plans for his execution. This pleasantness serves not only to heighten the tension, but to tell us something more about Duncan's character, his seemingly benevolent naivety. He seems old and sweet and doddery, and in most productions he's cast just that way. The mention of the air also develops another motif in the play, namely that of smells, which we've already seen developed by the witches in their memorable catchphrase, There is cold. Fall is fair, hover through the fog and fill the air. Foul odours in this play are symbols of corruption and wickedness, associated with the witches and with Macbeth after he murders the king. Remember that this play was written at a time when the main theory of infectious diseases was the so-called miasmatic theory, whereby diseases such as cholera or even the bubonic plague were thought to be associated with foul smells in the air, hence the terrifying plague doctor masks that were filled with spices and wool so as to filter the air, and the old-fashioned medical advice of sea air and open windows in curing such ailments. Duncan's inability to perceive the foulness of this air is a symbol of his naivety, and it furthers the often talked about theme of appearances versus reality in this play. Fair is foul and foul is fair. The air which seems so fair to Duncan is in fact foul. So Duncan enters, and Lady Macbeth welcomes him, and here already we have another ominous component to this scene. Where's the Thane of Cordor? We cost him at the heels, <laughs> and had a purpose to be his purveyor. But he rides well, and his great love sharp as his spur hath helped him to his home before us. Give me your hand. Conduct me to mine host. Where on earth is Macbeth? This would have been a big deal in ancient Scotland. Macbeth left in scene 4 in such a hurry precisely so he could be there before the king to prepare for his arrival, since it was a great source of social shame should you not be around to personally receive your higher ranking guest. And he did in fact arrive first, as we know from the last scene, but in perhaps an even greater insult, he has not come down to the front door and is instead skulking around somewhere else in the castle thinking through his options for the murder, as we'll see in the next scene. This fact achieves two things. On the one hand, it is another piece of foreshadowing, another bad omen that this castle's air is perhaps not so pleasant as Duncan thinks. In the context of medieval hospitality traditions, failing to properly receive your host as the Macbeths do here is a terribly bad look. Macbeth's ultimate act of dishonouring his monarch is obviously murdering him, but that sort of behaviour starts to creep in as soon as the idea is planted in his mind. But even more important is the extent to which this implicitly cedes control to his wife, who at this point is much more intent upon the murder than he is. Macbeth's absence, ostensibly to plan the murder, ironically has the effect of handing over control to his wife. Traditionally, the male should be the one to welcome the monarch to the home. Through his absence, Macbeth surrenders that role to his wife, which, as we just discussed in the previous scene, plays into the association between corruption and gender inversion that runs through the whole of the play. Lady Macbeth, as she encourages Macbeth to commit the murder, at once insults his masculinity by saying he's not man enough to kill the king, but she also takes on the role of the male herself. She unsexes herself, as we heard earlier, to become the murderer she fears her husband cannot be, and here by receiving the king in her husband's place, she assumes the role of the man in the hospitality traditions of the age, a powerful symbol implying her level of control over her husband Macbeth. And so the scene ends, the lady leads the king into the Celtic darkness of the castle, and there, just as he wishes, he will meet Macbeth.